Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. And um, uh, I have 45 minutes. Is that correct? Okay, I'll watch the time. Um, uh, these are the members of our institute. What I'm presenting to you really is um, a collective work. We have been working on transference focused psychotherapy, as you know, specialized psychotherapy for severe personality disorders, particularly borderline personality disorder. And in that context, we have been trying to review and update and develop the treatment and and expanded it to looking at the entire area of psychodynamic psychotherapies and including psychoanalysis. And um, so what I'm presenting you is um, uh, one aspect of our work, development of general conceptualization of psychodynamics psychotherapies. The purpose of all of this is to make psychotherapeutic intervention more specific in order to be able to do research on the specific effects of um, uh, particular uh, intervention and compare um, different methods. And uh, um, as you know, in the psychodynamic field, that has been in the past a major problem. Um, hmm? I thought this should, I'm doing something wrong. I pressed this it, here. Um... Is it? Is it going? Oh, now it's going, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, now it's working. Um, if you try to specify psychoanalytic techniques, you run, in, you run into several problems. There have been shifts in psychoanalytic theory, important shifts, and into various directions. Um, um, so there is no longer a unitary theory, and each of these different directions have developed their own technical approaches so that psychoanalytic psychotherapy, which um, has been an application traditionally of psychoanalytic technique, um, some always remains behind the times, is about 10 or 20 years behind the developments in, in new psychoanalytic theoretical thinking and their technical implications. That has been one major problem. And another major problem, the blurring of boundaries between psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic psychotherapy, as reality has imposed itself in the sense that there are on a large number of patients, probably a majority of patients for whom a standard psychoanalysis is not possible, not indicated, not feasible. Uh, there are external pressure for trying to reduce the frequency. Standard psychoanalysis is a highly frequent psychotherapy, and uh, the question is, can it be delivered in a more concentrated way that goes together with the fact that it, uh, it doesn't work anyhow for the most severely ill patients. So external pressures and the internal changes have been combining and blurring the boundaries in the field, which has made everything um, more complex, what some people call psychoanalysis, others would say indignantly, that's not true psychoanalysis. Um, so people fight uh, very often about trivialities. Now, there have been some common features characterizing the development of psychoanalytic theories that are actually important and give a basis, a true basis for a contemporary concept of psychoanalytic technique. It's the shift from classical psychoanalytic theory to contemporary object relations theory. This shift um, permits um, a review of all psychoanalytic instruments, all technical approaches. There are clarification, specification, and, and um, classification. And um, so we have been able to define some basic psychoanalytic techniques that operate across the entire spectrum of psychodynamic psychotherapies and um, differentiated them from their applications to everything else that classically are called speci special 
techniques of psychoanalysis, and I want to summarize this to you briefly. The classical theory, as you know, um, is that uh, unconscious conflicts develop between drives, aggression, and libido on the one hand, and defensive mechanisms on the other, particularly the defenses of the ego, um, because the expression of those drives is not appropriate, adequate, not connected to reality. And um, the psychoanalytic treatment consists in a systematic interpretation of the defensive operation to, to permit the drives to operate in consciousness and then be elaborated, integrated into the conscious ego that resolves the conflict, resolves the symptoms. Brief synthesis of classical psychoanalysis. What has, ob what has contemporary object relations theory changed in that regard? First of all, uh, the concept of drives is formulated by Freud. It's a myth, and Freud himself recognized that uh, because he abandoned his own basis in neurobiology. By the way, he was a superb neurobiologist, for those who are not aware of that, and his sense that the development of clinical knowledge couldn't fit with the neurobiology, couldn't be based on the neurobiology of his time was absolutely correct. He would have a completely different view if he were alive today. But anyhow, um, we uh, consider that the primary motivators are not mythical drives, but are um, affect systems genetically determined, um, uh, constitutionally activated in the form of temperament, and we know the neurotransmitters and, and uh, central nervous system structures that um, are related to the activation of each of the particular affect systems, and these affect systems um, motivate the baby from birth on to interact, and those interaction with significant others that in psychoanalytic object relations theory are called object, are internalized as um, uh, representations of self and of other under the frame of a dominant affect. This is the basic concept of psychoanalytic object relations theory. So that affective interaction between self and other are internalized, particularly as the hippocampal function, as you already have heard. Um, and these dyadic structures constitute the building blocks of um, more complex psychological structures. At the end, what the, uh, the psychoanalysis describes as the id, the ego, and the superego are different um, uh, composite structures of these internalized units uh, with different functions. Um, and um, uh, we have um, described uh, particularly two major levels of development um, of the uh, personality, an early one in which uh, these internalized relation with others, these dyadic units of self object, affect, um, are organized in terms of the predominant positive or aversive kind of the affect, positive and negative affect system, so that what Freud called libido is really a composite of positive affect systems. We would say nowadays the combination of the attachment system, the erotic system, the uh, play bonding system, and um, the negative ones, a combination of uh, the fight-flight negative affect system and the separation panic system. So um, uh, if early level of developments would have a strict separation between the positive and negative, rewarding and aversive uh, systems of, of object relations organized in the frame of dominant affects, and a higher level second system would uh, represent an integration uh, 
uh, of the positive and negative one in the sense that the self components of the positive and the negative integrate into an integrated self, the object components integrated concepts of significant others, and this uh, development of an integrated self surrounded, so to speak, by integrated concept of significant others constitute normal identity in contrast to the early stage, which, borrowing a term from Ericsson, we've called identity diffusion. Um, this, I, I just gave you a summary of object relations theory, um, and uh, what the, are the technical implications? That the unconscious conflicts described by Freud and, and in the psychoanalytic literature are conflict not between abstract defenses and abstract drives, but between internalized object relations that acquire a defensive function opposed to internalized object relation that cannot be tolerated get to be rejected, repressed, or dissociated that acquire the impulsive function so that the, the, the conflict between impulse and defense is really a conflict between impulsive and defensive internalized object relations. The impulsive um, internalized object relations are real and fantasied experiences that have an intolerable quality because of the intensity of um, forbidden or dangerous aspect. It deals both in the aggressive segment and the sicker the patient, the more problems around aggression predominate or around sexual issues and in the relatively healthier patients is issues about forbidden sexuality that predominates and object, internalized object relations that go against them constitute the defensive organization, the internalized prohibitions, cultural demands and, and expectations that are transmitted in the family by the interaction between parental uh, figures and, and, and the child, those come to constitute those um, defensive issues. Now, what's the practical importance of this different view of what defenses and impulses are? the assumption that in the treatment, in the transference, what is going to emerge are relationships between self and other. The, in, the patient will activate certain real specific relations with the therapist that run counter the ordinary common sense relation that by contract were established as what's normal in the treatment. And these distorted internalized relations will reflect both defensive and impulsive rela relationships that can be clarified in the interaction. And the interaction between patient and therapist will be the uh, scenario in which the interaction between self-representation and object representation can be enacted, and the patient is going to do that, um, uh, representing his early self-representation while projecting his object representation on the therapist, or doing it with reverse form in, under certain conditions. We'll come back to this. So that uh, the, uh, what we call the transference is the uh, activation of uh, a number of internalized relationships that reflect unconscious conflicts both in the impulsive and defensive aspects and uh, permit us to diagnose in these transference distortions the unconscious conflicts, link these distortions to similar problems the patient has with other people because the more intense unresolved unconscious conflicts, the more intense if they, they, uh, they uh, in influence the patient's behavior, and that's what constitutes the pathological ways in which personality disorders habitually react with others. So we link transference with abnormal relation with significant others and eventually trace them back into the past. Trace them back in that the patient himself, 
becomes concerned. Why am I behaving this crazy way? Where does this come from? And gets to his past. So there is a shifting away from speculation about meanings uh, uh, and um, uh, leaving it up to the developments in the here and now to gradually illuminate the past. With this conception, we um, then looked again at all the technical intervention that psychoanalysis describes, um, a struggle with the fact that there is no integrated, generally accepted textbook of psychoanalytic technique. There has been a mystification of psychoanalytic technique that has to do something with problems in psychoanalytic education. But in any case, we felt we had to go beyond this lack of a generally accepted um, uh, uh, technique, particularly in the light of the changes that I mentioned initially about different theories and contradictory approaches to technique. And we concluded at the end that the four basic psychoanalytic technique in all psychoanalytic, uh, that are used in all psycho psychoanalytic treatment from stand, so-called standard psychoanalysis to uh, expressive psychotherapy um, and its various forms in, in various countries, um, the supportive expressive psychotherapy in this country, the uh, psychologisch orientierte psychotherapy in, the, in German literature, etc. And these four techniques are interpretation, transference analysis, technical neutrality, and countertransference interpretation. Interpretation consists in the cognitive clarification of the nature of the relationship activated uh, in, in the here and now relationship. It is the basic way to describe an interaction in terms of an aspect of the self relating to an aspect of the therapist at that moment. Um, or uh, doing the same cognitive analysis with relationships that the patient has with everybody else. Uh, we try to define what's fundamental in the relationship the patient has, say, with spouses, uh, um, siblings, parents, in terms of a specific relation between self and other. And insofar as we systematically analyze the relation with us, interpretation is applied to the transference, but not exclusively. This is why we have separated out transference analysis as the specific focus of, uh, of uh, abnormal internalized object relations in the transference, in contrast to interpretation as a broader concept that implies the analyzation of this relationship in the entire patient's life situation. Technical neutrality consists in the therapist's avoiding being seduced into participating in the relationship that the patient has activated, taking on the role of the patient's object or of the patient himself. The patient may be violently attacking the therapist. The therapist describes what is going on, divided into one part where he may be pissed off because he's being attacked, but he knows he is that in terms of a specific activated relationship, while at the same time as an excluded third party uh, describes, helps the patient to acquire a cognitive awareness, and not only a cognitive awareness, but at the same time um, in doing that uh, also creating a frame for the affect activation, in other words, um, implies um, a cognitive function to modulate affect. Um, you may say that uh, I identifies with the patient's cortex while the patient uh, activates his limbic system. A little simplified. Um, technical neutrality as an essential aspect of um, all psychoanalytic treatments, however, may vary under in, in special modifications of the treatment. And third, countertransference interpretation. We are referring to countertransference as the total emotional activation that occurs in the therapist that he has to use to better understand what's going on between him and patient. 
uh, technique consists um, to combine technical neutrality with openness to how one feels. Technical neutrality doesn't mean indifference. You can hate the, your patient, you can be sexually excited, you can fall as, or feel like falling asleep. Hopefully you catch yourself. And, uh, and uh, 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 at the same time, uh, be open to explore that in yourself. What the hell has been going on? Why am I reacting this way? Using that for better understanding the transference or counter-transference analysis is an internal process, not shared with the patient, but used for better interpretation of what's going on. I hope this clarifies um, these four basic techniques. And to be able to use them, we have created a special relationship, a special, quote, normal uh, relationship uh, which consists in the therapists having what has been called evenly suspended attention, being open to whatever emerges without having preset ideas, what should be talked about to really leave the initiative to the patient to activate what is most important and pressing in his mind and to ask the patient to free associate a method which consists that the patient shouldn't come with a prepared agenda um, uh, nor be too distracted by what's going on around him. So there is a consistency in the nature of the psychotherapeutic situation and the patient is invited to talk as openly and freely about whatever comes to mind. That's not as easy as it seems. Better functioning patients learn it throughout time in more severe patients, as you know, patients are not able to contain in their mental functioning intense affect activation. It tends to express them in behavior very often while being blind to the implication of their behavior. So the therapist has to be prepared to interpret what the patient is saying and what he shows in his nonverbal behavior uh, using all the elements of what the patient says, what he observes, and the counter-transference. Um, so the interaction is normal when it is defined as by the instruction that I just mentioned to be distorted by the transference. And sometimes, with serious cases, we have to limit uh, what the, the rights of the patient, give the patient instruction. He cannot attack the therapist. He cannot um, destroy objects in the office. That's no longer technically neutral. And when we do that, there's a sp special technique to revert to, to technical neutrality. There are all other kinds of psychoanalytic techniques that have been described and they are really, if you look at each of them, simply an application of these four that I mentioned to, sp to specific situations. So-called character analysis is the application of these techniques to the analysis of repetitive behavior patterns typical for each patient that reflect the specific traits, character traits or personality traits that he shows everywhere. So the focus on these habitual um, behaviors that take on defensive functions in the treatment situation um, is a specific application of the technique. The same happens with dream analysis. Dreams are considered a particular uh, distorted con content of uh, fantasies that reflected about to reveal a, a deeper content that at times may be of great value to the, uh, deepening the understanding of the patient's problems. We talk about enactment when a conflict is repeated in the treatment without the patients being aware, very often not the therapist being aware that they're repeating some um, object relation of the patient in the past, and we talk about acting out when that repeating replaces uh, the capacity for cognitive reflection in the patient about what's going on, and the patient uh, persists in the realistic nature of his distorted reaction so that the conflict is enacted with a lot loss of mentalizing capacity, which is called acting out, and we use the four instruments to analyze that. And the same with uh, 
um, um, the various functions of endless repetition of the same problems, somatization. Uh, there used to be a concept called resistance, um, which we have abandoned. What is called resistance are usually uh, activation of um, object relations that seem to run against the purpose of the treatment, negative um, um, transference developments, and uh, the so-called resistances are extremely interested at the kind of defensive object relations that need to be uh, analyzed. By the same token, you will hear in much literature the, the, the normal, non-objectable relationship between therapist and patient that helps them um, get along in spite of all the problems of the treatment. Uh, and uh, much research indicating a therapeutic alliance seems to be um, related to improvement. That is undoubtedly true, particularly for the better functioning patients, but with the sickest patients, therapeutic alliance, uh, uh, a working relationship between patient and therapist only occurs toward the end of the treatment, and we have developed techniques that permit treatment uh, where therapeutic alliance is almost zinch. Uh, we are happy if the patient shows up regularly to the sessions, and that can be analyzed by the techniques that I've mentioned. The same as um, uh, specific reactions of the patient of getting worse after he feels having been helped. And um, a new psychological concept the so-called importance of the analytic field is um, um, an interesting development to which these techniques can be applied, and I'll come back to this when I talk about schizoid personalities. And the psychology of termination of treatment clearly um, is a specific relationship between patient and therapist to be analyzed. In short, all of these are just applications of those four techniques, and each of them we have developed in great details the way to manage them. So they are, uh, uh, I cannot convey to you the degree of specificity that I believe we have been achieving. Um, now, if you compare psychoanalysis, transference-focused psychotherapy, mentalization-based psychotherapy, general psychodynamic psychotherapy, and so-called supportive psychotherapy on psychoanalytic basis, you will see that they use to a different extent these various techniques. And that um, can be specified further. I'm just saying that this general analysis permits a classification of these treatments. And you see... Uh, <coughs> that I've added supportive techniques which indicate which are really cognitive behavioral techniques based on psychoanalytic principles um, that may constitute the entire treatment in supportive psychotherapy and have various um, introduction and use in in some types but not in others some of uh, psychoanalytic types of treatment as you see. Here the concept is that we classify all this psychodynamic or psycholytically oriented psychotherapies not based on modification of psychoanalysis, but on the different ways in which these techniques are combined and to, to which supportive techniques are added to them or not. Now, I want to go into certain Doing okay. um, I want to go into typical ways in which the activation of this internalized object relations are maintained throughout lengthy times of the treatment. They constitute what may be called the structural aspects of the transference. And they uh, are a basic guideline to know how to understand what is going on and to interpret it. And you may recognize, as I give you, that those various types of structures 
um, the kind of patients that you are seeing in psychodynamic psychotherapy, or in other psychotherapies in which many of the patterns of these patients also show. Um, here is the basic unit of internalized object relations, self, representation, representation of other, and dominant affect. Early stages of development, sharp split between positive and negative internalized units of relation between self and other. Second stage of development, all the representation of self have been integrated in integrated concept of self. The concept of others have been integrated into integrated concepts of others, of others positive and negative. Their sexual characteristics become dominant. So um, this is the structure of borderline personality organization in which fixation occurs at that early level with the predominance of primitive defensive operations. This is what predominance in neurotic personality structures, high level predominance of advanced defense mechanisms. And you have to forgive me that I not spell all of this out, but I assume that uh, you, there's a general knowledge available of all of them. And this, which represents normal identity, is, by the way, that's the concept that has influenced the alternative classification of personality disorder of DSM-5. So the, our classification system has begun to integrate the concept of object relations theory about 30 years after these ideas have been developed. Um, it's a good development, although it has been a slow one. Um, in the treatment, this is the, um, this is the structure that you find in patients with so-called neurotic personality organization, hysterical personalities, obsess obsessive compulsive personalities, um, uh, depressive masochistic personalities, um, and in the treatment, what is typical is that the patient, uh, particularly if it's a very intense long-term treatment, regresses, it is, in other words, that the patient reactivates early behavior patterns in which the patient repeats the way he related to significant persons in the, of the past. The therapist becomes the, the depository of the object representation of the, of the persons in the past to whom the patient related in different ways. And the patient maintains an integrated self, except it's, it's gone back to the past and repeats past relationship. Example, um, a woman with a hysterical personality who... Um, Uh, in the early stages of the treatment, perceives me as an extremely strict and demanding person. Everything she says, she's afraid I'll be against it. I'll be criticizing her. I don't think she should behave that way. And um, it, it turns out that I'm like a very restrictive, dominant and controlling mother uh, with whom she had uh, terrible problems that now repeats themselves in, in the relation with other people, with her children, with her sister. After a period of time, this shifts. I become friendlier. And, but I become like a weak man, somewhat funny, um, this bald little man, not a real powerful man who excites her, uh, friendly but desexualized <laughs> and... Um, and um, uh, that, in turn, was the role that she resented. Her father had totally dominated my mother. And finally, she gets into a relation where this changes again, in which uh, there is a positive sexual relation in which I seem like a powerful and unavailable man and intense rivalry with the fantasies she has about my wife. So 
I'm, I'm summarizing months of treatment, but as you see, different relationship in which she maintained an integration of self with different relations to different people projected. Typical uh, development uh, that was described in classical psychoanalysis that dealt mostly with neurotic patients. Then we have the second case is that of a borderline personality organization the maintenance of splitting between idealized and persecutory relationship, all good and all bad relationships, um, a fixation at the early stage of development. That's typical for borderline personality disorder, but actually for all uh, severe personality disorders, with exception of the second, of, with exception of the complication given by narcissistic and, and uh, schizoid personality to which I come back. Here, the patient activates different aspects of self, co totally contradictory, and different aspect of others, and uh, interchanges roles easily. So there's that apparent chaos uh, that was described in borderline patients before we could understand the organized quality of this in terms of an object relations concept that explains the split between idealized and persecutory relations. Clinical example. Uh, this is a norm. Uh, no, this is actually, I used as an example a patient whom I presented last year for those who may remember an extensive presentation of a patient that I did, um, it's um, a, a woman in her early 20s with a borderline personality disorder, um, impulsivity, rage attacks, severe suicidal behavior, multiple drug abuse, sexual promiscuity. Uh, I think those were the most important symptoms uh, you can add to that. Um, in the treatment with me, uh, apparent chaos, but there were typical relations in which, uh, oh, by the way, this woman was, um, um, she had been bitterly, uh, physically attacked, physically abused, severely traumatized by a sadistic mother, uh, objectively so, uh, very severely. In the treatment, uh, in the treatment, there were, she became extremely violent, to me, uh, um, threatening, uh, destroying objects, insulting me in public, um, in, at one point actually really destroying the plants in my office. And there were other times when, of course, she saw me as brutally attacking her, felt that it was an, uh, terrible that I should ask her to end the end of the session. This, this was, a, she had important things to say, how could I do that to her? So the same relationship enacted. Now I was the sadistic mother and she was the poor victim. At other points, to the contrary, she became a little baby and wanted to be uh, 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 treated warmly and softly and uh, told me all her problems. I had fantasies that if I, uh, she could stay with me forever, she would be okay. And to the contrary, there were times where she said, you don't look good today, Dr. Kernberg. Are you all right? There anything? Don't, are you working too much? Are you going home in the evening? So uh, uh, now she was a, a caring mother, and I was a well-taken-care child. To the, so the, and then again, there could become the same violence. And at the same time, totally separate, she got involved with a 20-year, no, 30-year, a 30-year-old man uh, with whom she had an intense sexual relationship um, uh, who wanted to marry her, but she refused that. But she, uh, she felt that uh, uh, that was a real wonderful relation, while at the same time she was involved with other men with whom she had promiscuous behavior uh, in a superficial, exploitive way. Uh, all of this zero in the relation with me, 
over an extended period of time and only in advanced stages of the treatment, these two kind of contradictory relationships became activated. Of course, she felt exploited by men as well, and um, the same role reversals occurred. So multiple relationships of a positive and negative kind and the treatment, transference focused psychotherapy, consisted in each of these to clarify fully self and object, their interchange, the gradual tolerance of the patient of these extremes without having to deny their contradictory nature with the gradual integration and weaving of now tolerated opposite relationships into a gradual integration uh, of the self and of the realistic conception uh, of others. The th third type of consolation is a narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, I don't have time here to explain how and why this basic borderline structure is transformed under certain conditions in which a grand grandiose self-concept protects the patient against the underlying chaos of that borderline world that I've described. It, is, uh, it happens under conditions in which severe traumatization and or um, an uh, uncontrolled spoiling combine in a child uh, who feels that one can be admired but there is no thing as real love. Admiration replaces love and the purpose of life is to be admired and the capacity for love decreases enormously. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but in the treatment, um, but the, stru the psychological structure for a long period of time is really the activation of a pathological grandiosity, a, a, an, an integrated, unrealistic, grandiose self while the patient projects all unacceptable um, negative, hostile, devalued aspects of self and others onto others uh, and has desperately to maintain his superiority on the one hand, but he needs to be admired by others because of the poverty of in, internal good representations, all of which have been incorporated into that concept of the self. In the, in the treatment, these patients show grandiosity, devaluation of the therapist over extended period of time uh, to an extent which I think doesn't leave any therapist without periods of feeling terribly inferior, devalued and incompetent. Re uh, reject all efforts to look at different ways of relating between self and others. Uh, they seem like patients who don't develop transference and um, uh, it takes many months to transform uh, but there are moments of sudden inferior sense of inferiority in which this gets reversed and where they feel they are the worst, most worthless, most uh, contemptible, inferior beings while the therapist becomes their savior, the potential know-it-all and uh, om, om, omnipotent um, uh, 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 relation, uh, relationship that rapidly reverts again into the opposite so that grandiosity punctured by moments of inferiority is typical of many months that it takes to discover behind this structure, the underlying primitive structures of borderline patients that I described before. Clinical example. Um, this is a businessman, extremely effective, um, who um, has uh, um, problems of impotence with his wife. He is... Um, uh, totally uninterested in her, but he would like at least to have sex with her to, and is, uh, thinks he may need treatment because of that. He's very potent with a um, um, number of prostitutes. He has 
set up. It's a very wealthy business when he can afford. He has a little harem uh, for himself um, with uh, with a madam who um, uh, uh, arranges the women for him. And um, in the treatment, um, um, he has an attitude of a defiance. So let me see what you can do to make me change. Um, uh, treats me very soon as an incompetent therapist who has no idea about real life, um, makes fun of me, makes fun of treatment, of psychiatry, discovers all the little incompetences this from my opening the door to my saying goodbye and creates an atmosphere. It talks about me to other people to describe how all the jokes they make about psychoanalysts are totally real, um, uh, creates moments um, uh, in which I have serious counter-transference problems. <laughs> uh, um, and, um, and then the terrible moments, his wife gets fed up because of the sadistic way in which this man is trying to control her. And... Uh, uh, at the bottom behind the impotence was an intense rage and and uh, desire to kill her that he was afraid of. But it took a long time to get to that, except that there were moments of panic when she said, I'm fed up, I'm moving out. And then I would get calls, uh, Dr. Kronberg, I need your uh, help immediately. You have to talk with her. Uh, and... A week later, again, I was the fumbling idiot. So um, it, uh, uh, if one is not prepared for that, these are patients who give one the feeling there's nothing one can do, and uh, one feels uh, better uh, referring them to a colleague whom one doesn't like particularly. Um, <laughs> um, the next condition, um, the schizoid personality. Um, now, here's a problem in the psychoanalytic literature that probably doesn't affect you. Uh, the term paranoid schizoid position and schizoid mechanism is used by Klein and psychoanalysis to refer in general to the condition of, of borderline patients. So that's different from the traditional assessment of the schizoid personality as you, schizoid and schizotypal, as you know it from the DSM, which is an, an important clinical entity. And if these patients are treated with this psychoanalytic approach, there is a, an emergence of a very typical and difficult situation, namely a fragmentation of affect, a specific general fragmentation of affect so that rather as splitting between idealized and persecutory relation, it is as if the patient had no clear affect or couldn't describe what he feels and the patient has no integrated sense of self and has a sense of being different people at different times, although that may not show. It is not there is a clear split between ideal and persecute ways, but a general confusion, which I have marked there by the multiple yellow spots inside that blue circle, indicating multiple fragments, really fragments of self relating to fragments of others. And that creates in the interpersonal attitude um, uh, of the treatment, a sense of emptiness and confusion and incapacity to decide what kind of affective relation is there. It is as if the patient were not relating, as if he were, as if he were in a, in, in, out on cloud seven, not the coldness and contempt of narcissistic personalities. That's a very active affective relation but it is a sense of, of, of confusion and emptiness. If one tries to clarify to the patient what's going on, the patient may feel invaded because he doesn't know and the therapist is putting pressure. And the patient 
honestly cannot tell what is going on. The therapist discovers pretty soon that this is not the ideal way to, to change the situation. Um, and there is a peculiar atmosphere in the session which has, um, which, which acquires specific affective qualities. It is as if one were in a threatened situation or a vaguely erotic situation, but one can't define where it comes from until one realizes that this is a specific general atmosphere that has to be transformed into something that is going on and the patient is trying to avoid. And at that point, the, the, the relationship clarifies into a specific, usually primitive split object relation, but not necessarily so. Sometimes it acquires a pretty complex advanced one, and that's the beginning of change. So one has, with these patients, very often with these patients, there is an uh, intense need to depend but at the same time, a horror of it, a wish to be close, but a fear of being engulfed, a contradiction that is solved in various ways and, and paralyzes the therapist. Example, um, a woman um, uh, in her 20s uh, who, um, with a schizotypal personality, um, uh, who had been diagnosed as schizophrenic, uh, I had examined her, it was, uh, it was the wrong diagnosis, um, and um, I treated her uh, with transference focused psychotherapy, an early case in which I had not yet clearly defined some elements of the treatment, but in any case, I, I, I found myself in this atmosphere. This was a woman who had she would, she would cut herself, little cuts all of her body, just superficial ones to watch a drop of blood. And so in the sessions, a vague talk as if she were having a, um, a, a kind of um, lack of uh, integration of, uh, of language without uh, a really... Uh, al formal alteration of thought processes, but with an extremely vague way of talking that would distract me. I couldn't listen to her. My, my, I, I was going to get distracted and inattentive. So we were sitting. She was talking, and I was. My thoughts were going into other direction, and that went on for weeks. Um, patient was hospitalized at that point, and um, uh, those were times with long time hospitalization. And after several weeks, and, and there, there was some vague quality as if there was something sexual going on, not erotic, but as if if something about blood had some sexual and aggressive element. And uh, all of a sudden, in one session, I had the memory of a um, film I'd seen six months earlier, Italian film, um, the, um, um, the examination of a citizen or the conviction of a citizen beyond suspicion, a district attorney in charge of looking for a murder of women and who turned out to be himself the murderer. And there was a scene in the movie where he was having sex. The woman was sitting on him. Uh, she was uh, beginning to have an orgasm when he pulled a knife, cut her throat, blood went running over her breasts, and she died. And, and I remembered that scene in the middle of the session with that patient with a mixture of uh, excitement and disgust and asking myself, what the hell is going on? And, I'm thinking, uh, uh, and I, I didn't pay attention to it and tried to forget it. But it was very intense. And it was uh, 
in that strange empty atmosphere. Two or three weeks later, the patient told me that she had had a strong wish that I should kill her, I should shoot her. If I did shoot her, she would, I would become a murderer. She would stay in my memory forever. She would be reunited with me forever and she would die happily knowing that she would be part of me and my life forever. And she said that in a way that sounded so convincing that I was thinking, hey, what's wrong with this logic? Um, uh, I think I've illustrated, I've illustrated this has to do with the use of um, the fields, namely the emotional atmosphere created in the hour without one is able to pinpoint any specific interaction. Uh, that's the typical schizoid organization of the transference. The next one is um, so-called symbiotic transference development. And by the way, the word symbiotic is used in two ways for what I'm now going to describe and also uh, for psychotic transferences um, in which there is, oops, in which there is really a lack of differentiation between self and other. I will not talk about that, but um, because the, these are patients for whom a very specialized form of psychoanalytic psychotherapy may be indicated. But I'm talking about um, symbiotic, where there is still a differentiation between self and other, but, uh, um, but the, um, the patient cannot tolerate any idea, any other person other than him and the therapist. And the therapist has to be in total agreement with the patient. The patient doesn't tolerate any outsider or any outside idea, any independent idea that the therapist may have. And uh, if the therapist disagrees with the patient, the patient feels that that is a terrible invasion, a destructive invasion of the patient's mind or a total abandonment. Uh, so there is an intolerance of triangulation. These are very primitive transferences with the most extremely regressed borderline patients. Example, uh, uh, a woman uh, uh, goes to the cemetery, um, uh, her sister has died, um, there is a mourning period. She cries loud and uh, dramatically uh, if, and, and tries to throw herself into the grave. She has to be picked up, uh, taken away. I mean, she makes an impossible scene uh, with extreme uh, dramatics and uh, comes to the next session enraged um, with the therapist um, because she has been mistreated, the entire family, nobody really mourns the death. She's the only one who mourns the death. How could she be treated? They threw her out of the ceremony of, at the cemetery. The therapist tries to tell her, well, maybe your behavior, how can you say that you are agreeing with them? She gets into a rage attack. She cannot tolerate that the therapist have any different view about her vision it is not only that she disagrees, but it is, a, it is an origin of panic. He has to agree with her. Other than that, it's a destruction of the treatment. Uh, these are moments of symbiotic transference. And the way to deal with them, of course, is first of all, one has to forget the concrete issue that one is, arg quote, arguing about with the patient and has point out to the patient how extremely painful it is to be confronted with somebody whom she wants to be close to and have a good relation and who thinks differently, that that is the most terrible thing that can help on the start of the treatment. I have already mentioned to you that in a case of, a, and that is the last type of um, uh, transference structure, typical for psychotic patients. And uh, let me say that, of course, 
we have, don't do intensive psychotherapy, we treat psychotic patients with medication, but there is a small subgroup of patients who, as you know, remain chronically schizophrenic while remaining relatively capable of still maintaining some object relations in the external reality um, with um, uh, normal affective expression and um, a cognitive organization uh, where psychoanalytic psychotherapy may be indicated. I'm quoting here particularly work of Michael Stone. Um, uh, so this is more theoretically interesting at this point than practically. I'll give you an example. Um, this is a tr patient I treated in uh, 1959-60 at Johns Hopkins under supervision of John Whitehorn, chairman, um, uh, a, psych a, a schizophrenic woman. This was the time when uh, the uh, thoracene was just beginning to be used and um, intensive psychotherapy for psychosis was still prevalent in the Washington, Baltimore area. And I was instructed to see that patient. I saw her for about six months. She was extremely disorganized, uh, tore apart everything that one put on her. And so she had to be put into a specialized cell naked. And I would go into that cell uh, while she was sitting naked, masturbating and smelling her fingers. This is how the treatment started. The strange thing is that for weeks there was not the slightest erotic element in that relation. I didn't have... This was a very attractive 18-year-old. Um, uh, I didn't have the slightest sexual excitement. Um, and it, it was not an issue. We talked about... Um, um, dangerous armies, uh, all kind of crazy war situation. I'm going to a moment where at one point I come into the cell and there's an erotic atmosphere. I mean, there is clearly, I feel uneasy. Um, I look at the, <laughs> at, the, at the window where the nurse could be observing us uh, as if I was looking f for help. Um, and the patient has a seductive attitude, uh, clearly an erotic seductive attitude, and tells me, you are the devil, you are the devil, uh, with um, a kind of fear and sexual excitement, and uh, at the same time moves uh, uh, as if she were trying to hypnotize me or, or get me into a trance uh, of sexual excitement. Uh, so I pointed out to her, uh, I, I think the, the, the devil is here and I'm the devil, but you are at the same time, we are both the same thing. It's very confusing. That's the kind of uh, psychotic transference um, and here, the general technique, I think, was magnificently described by Searles many years ago. First, lack of contact. Second, what he called a symbiotic relation. I'm calling it uh, psychotic to differentiate it from the third, differentiation. Fourth, integration. Uh, here, what interests me only is the long periods of time of this kind of transference. To conclude, I have been trying to illustrate um, the effort to develop an integrated system of psychoanalytic techniques um, for the entire spectrum of psychoanalytic psychotherapists, differentiates them sufficiently to be able to assess whether they are being used how much they are being used and to what extent there are contradictory uses in terms of a specific technique. Second, the main structural uh, organizations of the transference 
and their linkage with different types of psychopathology and how the techniques are applied differently given these structures. And third, that the therapist's intuitive attitude towards what is affectively activated, um, free and intuitive attitude is not in contradiction to a very specific theory of technique and theory of structure. I think that scientific precision in technique and, 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 and structure uh, is what provides a, a realistic uh, frame for research on the other hand and on the other for an intuitive approach to each patient, to each session without running the risk of getting lost in the never-never land of uh, psychoanalytic speculation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>